feel the prophetic voice of heaven speaking to me this morning, and it's going to translate beautifully into the prepared words, but in Joel chapter 2, we're familiar with this text. I won't have you stand much longer, but just in an attitude of worship, we can do it, right? For those who are able. The words of the prophet Joel in the second chapter, they read this. I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike, and I will cause wonders in the heaven and on earth. The blood, excuse me, on earth, blood and fire of columns of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Before we take one step forward into the message this morning, if there's anybody in here who say, Pastor, I came in today and I need Jesus to save me, I want you to slip your hand up. Anybody in here? Anybody just, I need Jesus' saving grace in my life. Before we go anywhere else, I see hands going up, maybe recommitments, maybe the first time. I see hands moving up throughout the sanctuary, just people saying, I need the saving grace of Jesus. You can stay right where you're at today because I want to be responsive to what I believe the Holy Spirit is doing. But if you're in here and you've lifted your hand to say, I need the grace of Jesus in my life, I want you to know you're in good company. Amen? You're in good company. You're in the right place today. And I want to pray for you. And I want you to repeat, friend, who lifted your hand in an attitude of worship, just stay with your heart before the Lord. We can all repeat, but those who lifted their hands, I want you to repeat this simple prayer of confession of sin and need of Jesus. Can we do it together? Let's do it. Heavenly Father, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. There are many. I need Jesus, his saving grace, his work in my life, and his presence from this day forward. Be my Lord. In Jesus' name. You may be seated in the house of the Lord in an attitude of worship. I realize that uh, there's a moment of announcements that we normally go through with encouragement to give. And there's some wonderful updates to the Mexico missions trip. And I'm going to encourage you to jump on our social media pages to check those things out and familiarize yourself with some of the wonderful things that are going on. But I want to be obedient to what the Lord is doing. Amen. Many of us are actually quite familiar with that passage of scripture that I just read. Many of us have used it in times of, of encouragement and in seasons of calling on the name of the Lord. Many of us are very familiar with that prophetic word. What most of us are less familiar with is actually the preceding and probably the most important part of this uh, prophetic letter from, the, from Joel the prophet. And what we might not be familiar with is this, is far before God tells Joel and tells his people that he's going to pour his spirit out on all flesh, that sons and daughters would prophesy that he would do signs and miracles and wonders. Before he did that, he called the priests. He called the pastors. He called the shepherd of the church to literally stand between the people of God and weep and wail and intercede for them. He said, I want you to stand. I'm going to read it to you in just a second. Joel chapter 2 or 3. Joel chapter 2, it's in verse 17. He's instructing the priest. He's saying, before I pour out my spirit, and you've got to read this right, you've got to read all scripture. Before you get to that part of the promise, and the part we don't like is this call to repentance. And then this place of intercession where the shepherds and the priests would come in and say, Father, we know you're holy, and I know you see the sins of your people. And so we're going to pray now, and we're going to, we're going to, the shepherds and the pastors would pray and intercede for the people. Friends, that's what Jesus is doing right now at the right hand of the Father. You understand that? He is our high priest, and he's making intercessions on behalf of the saints. But yet I felt symbolically that the Lord instructed me today to lead us in a moment of prayer before we move into what I believe God would encourage the church with today. And so if you'll allow me a moment, in the uh, plan of 
the shepherds and the pastors who've gone before me and the great ministers who've gone before me to pray for you. In Joel chapter 2, it says, Let the priests who minister in the Lord's presence stand and weep between the entry room to the temple and the altar. And let them pray, Lord, spare your people. I'll say one more contextual thought before I pray, and I'll probably cry a little bit because that's what the Lord does to me as I'm in his presence. We're not familiar as an American church watching people pray. But Dre, I felt like the Spirit of the Lord has told me this week, how will my people learn to pray if they don't watch somebody pray? How, how will my children learn to pray if their parents don't pray? And so if you'll allow me a moment of shepherding the church, I'd love to pray for you. Father, it's a privilege to pray for your church. It's a privilege that you've chose to identify with people on this earth through your son Jesus, marked by your Holy Spirit. Father, I've got friends in here, some of them I don't even know, but friends, men and women and children in here who are here because they've been brought, but they don't know you. And I pray in the name of Jesus that they would know you today. Father, your word declares to us in the book of Proverbs that eyes that see and ears that hear are a gift from the Lord. And so I'm praying in the name of Jesus for your people, interceding for your saints and before your presence, Father, that not one person would come through the house of the Lord today and not know you. God, I pray that we would see the divine things of God with spiritual eyes. I know it's hard to understand in this flesh, but you can do it, Lord. You've done it before, and I pray for ears to be opened in the name of Jesus. I pray for ears to be opened to the voice of God, to the prophetic voice of God, to the instruction of the word of the Lord. I pray now, Father, for your people, that they would be receptive and full of hopefulness, Lord. This world has grown dim. Father, my neighbors don't know their left hand from their right. My my school teachers often aren't allowed to even teach common sense anymore. Our world is upside down. And I'm praying for your strength. I'm praying for you to give endurance and spiritual sensitivity and awareness and boldness and courage that comes by your spirit for your people. Lord, I pray that we'd be less worried about offending the world and more worried about offending your heart. God, I pray that our eyes would be uh, uh, continually, effectually turned towards the things of God and that we would weep for the things that, that break your spirit and break your heart. Father, I pray for fresh conviction of sin upon your people. What a, what a wretched thing to not be convicted of sin. Lord, I pray that in those moments of you showing us mercy through conviction that we would turn quickly from the things that sadden you confess them and look to the grace that you've given through Jesus and Father finally I pray in the name of Jesus that there be power upon your church oh Lord we've read it this morning it's been spoken by your spirit and by your word that we would move in power and signs and wonders and Father it is my prayer not that we would move in those things, that we would boast. No, my boast is in the cross of Jesus Christ and Christ alone. But Father, that there would be power and healing in our hands and in our words so that men and women and children would immediately see Jesus. These are the prayers I offer for your saints today. May we learn to wait and weep and wail. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for letting me pray for you. It's such a privilege. I'm going to move quickly into the prepared moments of the message today. I felt earlier in the week that God had really spoke to me and given me assignment for the house of the Lord today. So I believe God is going to bless you wherever you're at. Amen. Say, Pastor, I'm ready. All right. Lie to me. Tell me I'm beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
But you know where liars go. The altar, we'll see you momentarily, all right? I felt like God led me last week through a series of remarks that Pastor Bobby had made. I was so blessed by his teaching over the last couple weeks. And uh, I felt like the Lord had said, hey, Paul, uh, I want you to pause the Gospel of Mark series because I have a word for the church. But I believe the word is going to be unpackaged in a different kind of way today. Sometimes God speaks through teaching and articulation, but sometimes he speaks through the teacher, the counselor, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Is that true? Amen? I just want to make sure my church and my people are awake and alive and ready because I don't want you to miss what the Lord has for you because there is divine appointment waiting, literally divine appointment waiting for some people in here today. God has led me to pray for you, church, and I'm going to ask some of our ministry leaders, some of our pastors to come and pray and intercede for you today. Because we got to be a church that knows how to pray. We have got to be a church that knows and understands that prayer is an integral, vital part of the house of the Lord. It's not an afterthought. It's not something we do because mama told us. It's something we do because God instructed us. Amen? Excuse the runny grossness up here. I'll blow my nose in a moment when my guest comes up to pray. The first thing that we're going to pray for this morning is expectation. Expectation. Maybe you came into the house of the Lord this morning and your expectation was absent, meaning you didn't have any. Maybe you came into the house of the Lord this morning, but your heart and your circumstance have clouded what you know God will prepare you to walk in expect. What I mean is this, there is a day, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, should I have time at the end of the service, that the early church showed up expecting God to do something. They expected God to do something because they knew if God didn't do something, they had nothing. I'm just setting the table with this. But friends, I need you to understand, there's a moment for us to have expectation of the house of the Lord again. I want to speak to my brother and sister and remind you and stir your heart for maybe the expectations or the hopefulness that God could or would or will do something that maybe seems impossible. I believe God can do anything. I believe our worship director said it today. Julian, you said it. You said, God is bigger than cancer. I'm not saying this to be sensational. I'm reminding heaven and earth that we believe by faith that God is bigger than any circumstance and any situation we might face. And if we'll call on the name of the Lord, if we'll wait on him to do something, God might just blow our socks off. He might. He's not a genie in a bottle. He's holy and wonderful. And we're privileged to call on his name and to wait and to watch and to see if he might move on our behalf. Amen? But friends, I believe expectation is the focus of prayer. Pastor Bobby, come on out here, my friend. Maybe your heart for the house of the Lord has grown cold. Maybe counsel from Scripture is optional. I'll say it again. Maybe expectation when you read the word of the Lord is optional or even despised. Maybe your faith in God has grown apathetic or absent. I believe wholeheartedly that the Lord would speak to you today and bring expectation back to your heart. If you're in here, Pastor Brown, I'm going to kick it over to you in just a second. You say, Pastor, I came to the house of the Lord. God would meet you today if you came into the house of the Lord today and you said, my heart has grown cold. I have little to no expectation for my family. I have little to no expectation for my own faith. I have little to no expectation for my children. Come on. I have little to no expectation for the Holy Spirit to meet me in my private time or in my public time of worship. If that's you, I want you to stand up. God's going to speak to you today. He's going to strengthen you right now. If you're in the house, you say, Pastor, that is me. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I need God more than I need this man's approval. I need God more than I need this mama's approval. I need God more than I need anything else. Pastor is going to pray for you. You are going to meet God today. Come on, if you're standing, lift your hands. Lift your hands with an open hand right now. And pray along with me. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord. First of all, God, we want to apologize. We're sorry, Lord, if we ever come into your presence without an expectation that you could do what a mighty work in our life. We're sorry. Forgive us for that. So right now, we know the Holy the Spirit of God is moving in this place. And I pray, Lord, that you will just give a fresh anointing of your spirit on everyone whose hand is lifted up right now. Touch their mind, touch their heart, Lord. 
And that from this day forward, whenever we assemble ourselves together corporately or even go before you, Lord, one-on-one, that we come with a spirit of expectancy, God, for you to show up and show out and do what only you can do in the name of Jesus. Come on, just receive it right now. If your hand is up, say it with me. I receive it because I believe it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, those of you standing. God is going to bring expectation to you, sister. God is going to bring expectation to you, brother. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Continue to wait on the Lord. This is the Lord's appointment for some people today. There's going to be some teaching and some articulation, but before we do that, a couple more things. A little bit more in the monitor, if I could, Ron. I appreciate that. The second thing that we're going to pray for today is going to be forgiveness forgiveness. There's appointment in the house of the Lord today for somebody who has chose not to forgive. God wants to free you of that burden. May I remind you, church, before we bring this petition to the Lord, Jesus said in the sixth chapter of Matthew, I believe it is, that if we don't forgive our brothers who have sinned against us, that the Father won't forgive us of our sins. These matters have huge spiritual implications, and I believe unforgiveness is keeping some people from the presence of God. I believe the Lord has given me this word to pray for you and allow for you to stand even in a moment of confession and say, Father, I have held on to this long enough, but no more. I know what she said, and it's going to hurt, but I'm not going to carry bitterness on the back end of that hurt. I know what he did. He stepped out on me again, and I have not forgiven him all these years, all these days later. Sister, friend, God wants to do a work in your heart. If he can forgive you, we can forgive them. If you're in here today, I'm going to ask Ashley to come and pray for this. And if you're in here today and you say, Pastor, I have held forgiveness long enough, but I am letting it go today. What you're saying is for me. I didn't know how to approach it, but I've got to lay something down before the Lord. I want you to stand up right where you're at. God's going to meet somebody this morning. Anybody, anybody bold enough? Thank you, sister. Anybody bold enough to say, I'm not carrying this anymore. I am letting it go. I love this. Freedom's waiting for you, brother. Freedom of the Lord's waiting for you, sister. God's going to meet you right where you're at. Let's pray. If you're standing, I'm going to ask you to just, like Paul just said, open your hands as a sign of just surrendering that unforgiveness as unto the Lord. God, I ask right now in the name of Jesus that we would be a people and there would be a banner over this house, that we would be quick to forgive and forget and find freedom in your name. Lord, I pray right now that the bondage of the enemy, those seeds planted by the enemy through unforgiveness of bitterness and hurt and anger, God, that you would just pluck them out right now in the name of Jesus from those hearts, that those burdens would be lifted. God, we just surrender our unforgiveness to you right now in the name of Jesus, and we know that it is a privilege to forgive because we have been forgiven. And I pray for my brothers and sisters in the house that are struggling with that right now in the name of Jesus. There would be freedom as they leave this place today. They would leave that bitterness behind God and to walk out in freedom from you. Amen. So good. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Brother, God's going to minister to you. He's going to touch your spirit. I see earnestness and eagerness, and God loves that in his people. Be encouraged this morning. Isn't it a good news, Larry, that God sees us? Right where we're at. Amen. I got two more prayer points this morning. Listen, church, I knew when the Lord spoke to me this week, I told Ash, I said, man, this is going to be a different service for some people. And I felt like all week long as I've prepared, I feel like the Lord's like, I'm ready for some different. I'm ready to pour myself out into the church and to do a thing that even you're not ready for. And so continue to pray for me and the leaders of the church. Brother Andre, I'm going to invite you up at this time. Andre, I've asked Andre to pray in an area of humility. That we would be humble people. 
May I remind you of the word of the Lord in Matthew, excuse me, in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Many of you have this memorized. It says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God? You say, Pastor, I'm not really sure what you mean by walking humbly before the Lord. Let me just throw some things out there as a shepherd and as a pastor and somebody who loves you enough to tell you the truth would. If you are still unable to bow your knee before the Father, if you are unable to pray for your spouse, if you are unable to read the word of the Lord and allow it to correct you, if you're unable to find yourself in a place of repentance before Father God, there may be a pride issue there. And that's for you and the Holy Spirit and me and the Holy Spirit to work out. Amen? But I would pray for you that you would find great humility in your walk with the Lord. I'm going to ask you uh, to kind of do what I do if, you, if you'd like to. And if you need this prayer, go ahead and take a stance of humility before the Lord. Uh, Father, you're so gracious, Lord. And Lord, I pray for every family, every man, every woman, Lord, that they would humble themselves before you, Lord, surrendering all burdens, Lord, before you, Lord. But Lord, most of all, Lord, that your spirit would give them the, the spirit of acceptance, Lord, that they could accept correction, that they can accept, Lord, things that they've done wrong, that they can confess them to you, God. I pray, Lord, that you would overwhelm them with your presence, Lord, that they would come before you naked, Lord, emptying themselves before you, Father God. I pray for each and every one, Lord, that strongholds would be broken over their lives, Lord, that they would know, Lord, that they're only captivated by the enemy, but released by your spirit, Father. I pray for that, Lord, to take place in their life, Lord. I pray for that humility, Lord, Father God, that they would come before you in a matter. So, Father... Have your way with your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dre. Thank you, Dre. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Woo. We're going to address this format in a few minutes scripturally so you can understand, although unconventional, it's full of power and wonder. Where we let God move, God will move. Amen? I want to pray for you, church over this last prayer point, I want to pray that God will give you courage. We have prayed this morning that we would come into the house of the Lord, we would carry with us spiritual expectation, amen, that God would revive heart. Doesn't that sound good, to have a revived heart for the things of the Lord? Lord, do it upon your people as we pray and humble ourselves. We've asked God for forgiveness this morning, that we would not uh, carry offense and bitterness against anything that's been wronged towards us, and we've all experienced wrong. Amen? We're in this together. Let's lay it before the Father. We've asked God for humility this morning. We've prayed that we would be a humble people, able to take and receive correction, that we'd be humble enough to be partners to the Spirit of the Lord. And lastly, I want to pray for courage. Some of you in the house, and I know this because the Lord has revealed this to me in prayer, some of you have been experiencing absolutely unexplainable fear. Fear over what could be, fear over something in your family, fear over uh, the political scene, fear over the, the wonkiness of the world, can I get a witness, fear over whatever it might be. But I want to tell you what the Lord says. For I have not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, and of power and of sound mind. And so I'll repeat what the Lord has said, not what Pastor Paul said. For I have not given you a spirit of fear, says the Lord, but a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind, says the Lord. Friends, I would pray that God will give you courage to face whatever it is that is holding you back. If the conduct and if the gain and the goal of your heart is godly and brings glory to the Lord and you've been too afraid to do it, I would have you stand up right now. We want to pray for you. We're not going to linger. You say, Pastor, I need courage. Somebody in here needs courage. Come on, Patrick. Somebody in here needs courage. You and me both, friend. Somebody needs courage to do what God has told you to do. The last thing we're going to do, friends, because there's power in prayer. Amen. I want you to stretch your hands, those of you who are sitting, towards those who have stood up. I want you to stretch your hands towards them in a sign, nothing more than a sign of faith, 
There's nothing mystical or magical about me extending my hand. It's just me saying, I'm in agreement, Father, that you're going to do something in her life. I'm in agreement that you're going to do something in his life. Stretch your hands or even put your hand on somebody if you're sitting who's standing just to encourage them. Sometimes a touch will go a long way. Amen. Heavenly Father, I'm praying in the name of Jesus on assignment from your Holy Spirit for courage to be released. In the name of Jesus, courage to be released. I'm not talking about some uh, uh, man-made serenade of emotionalism that comes and goes. I'm talking about a courageous spirit that comes from you, Heavenly Father. It was you who told Joshua as he advanced, prepared to advance into all you had called him to do. Be strong and courageous for I am going before you and I pray in the name of Jesus for every person who has stood in hopefulness for spiritual courage to take place in their life that it would be released now in the name of Jesus. I do believe there are people receiving divine courage right now. I do. In fact, I know it. Father, would you do it for your glory and because you love your people. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. I'm so excited this morning. You know, it's just some overflow of the heart before I move into some prepared comments. Some of you may have come in today and say, Pastor, I've been going to church a long time and I've never seen a moment of corporate prayer. I've never seen the pastor lead and intercede for the people. Friends, I got news for you. We got to do a lot more of that. It's something that if I'm being, amen, um, you can pray for me that the Lord would keep me sensitive and humble and eager enough to do his will and not my will. Amen. Um, And that we would be obedient, all of us pastors and elders and leaders and directors in the church to follow the spirit of the Lord. I want to talk to you this morning from Acts chapter 1 because I want to contextualize what we just did. And I think it's so important that we understand the early church juxtaposed to the church today looked wildly different. But I want to take you back to the early church so you can understand some of their behavior and why they did some of what they did. But let me set it up by saying this. In our Western world, Here in America, the United States, and certainly in the Western world, North America and South America, we have fallen into the trap that God moves when spiritually gifted people speak. We have fallen into the trap to believe, man, church is going to be good if pastors prayed up. We have found ourselves in cyclical, learned behavior through honest, good intentions of good people that we can come into the house of the Lord completely flat, completely unaware of anything that's taking place in us spiritually, in the church spiritually, or even in the globe spiritually. But I want to point you to what the Bible says about the early church, their behaviors, and why they did what they did. How's that sound this morning? Acts chapter 1, we're going to go straight to it. Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 4 and 5, it says this. This is, let me contextualize this. I have a little bit more time this service than I did last service. So let me contextualize this to say this. Jesus has been crucified. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 that he would appear from time to time to the apostles and to his followers just enough to reveal who he was. That is to suggest that when Jesus came back from the grave, resurrected, he didn't just live with the apostles. He would show up. His spirit would manifest. Go read Acts chapter 1. His spirit would manifest from time to time to the people who followed him, and he would encourage them. If you want to know what it means to be encouraged, it means to literally put courage in. Sometimes we need to be encouraged in sin to put courage in us to stay away from sin. Encouragement isn't necessarily feel good, pet me up, pat me on the back, and get me ready to go. Encouragement means to have the courage to do what needs to be done. And the Holy Spirit's encouragement is not necessarily a rah-rah It is putting courage in us to do what needs to be done. So Jesus would show up in Acts chapter 1, and he would encourage the apostles. Amen? And there's this particular verse right here where uh, Jesus is getting ready to descend, uh, excuse me, ascend into heaven. But he says this to the apostles. He says, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. 
As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is getting ready to go sit at the right hand of the Father as the high priest to intercede for the church, much of what we demonstrated this morning. Amen? But before he does that, he promises, he says, I'm not leaving you without help. I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit. This is the next thing that takes place after saying this. Jesus, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. So I want you to see this picture. The apostles who have seen their Savior, their King, the one who did all the wonderful signs and miracles and wonders, go into the earth, come back again, and begin to appear and walk through walls. You've got to go read the New Testament and show up and encourage his people. And now he's floating into the clouds, and they're going... Come back. And you can see their expectation in this next verse because this is what Scripture reveals. As they strain, some of you are straining to see Jesus. I hope so. I hope so. In this world and through his word, amen. They strain. Do you see the expectation, the earnest, eager expectation of the apostles as they strained to see him rising into heaven? Two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. And the angels said, that's not in Scripture, that's my deduction. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him. But here we are now, in the meantime. And what do we do in the meantime? Why don't we take a look at what the early church did? Now, you've got to understand, this was the behavior that was caused in the first followers of Jesus as a result of his departure. Has anything changed? He's still gone. We're still waiting for him to come back. So can't we learn a thing as a church body about how to be together and how to approach straining to see his return? Now, i got news for you. If you're not excited about Jesus coming back, we may be riding in different vehicles, okay? Because this message is geared towards somebody who's going, bruh, have you looked around the world? I need Jesus to come back in a hot minute. And I'm not angry at the world. I'm not angry at the world for being lost, church. They are lost. I don't expect a blind person to be able to describe colors. And I don't expect a spiritually blind person to be able to explain the divine presence of God. They need you and me. Oh, come on now. But here we go. The early church straining to see Jesus and we see now the overflow of their caused behavior due to the departure of Jesus in the hopeful expectation of his return have we set the stage they all joined together constantly in prayer let me pause here because some of us will be like oh they all joined together and then they prayed nope They didn't come together to talk about what the pastor should be doing. They didn't come together to talk about your HOA issues. They didn't come together to talk about how they need to feed your niece. Read it again. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers, and it gets better. Say there's more. There's more. They devoted themselves, the early church, Ron, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which we do a great job up here at the church. Amen? We do. I'm really proud of that. I'm so proud of our men's director, Andre, and our women's director, Ashley. I'm so proud of our teaching team. Pastor Daryl, when he was part of our flock, amen. And and Pastor Bobby and myself, we are unapologetic about teaching the word of the Lord. In fact, when you come back next week, we're going to be moving through the gospel of Mark verse by verse. We are not backing off of what God said because it's the only word worth hearing. I can promise you that. So we do a great job with this, and churches do a largely a pretty good job with teaching, but some of them are struggling. Amen? Some churches are not teaching the word of the Lord and the fellowship. So they devoted themselves, the believers, straining to see the return of Jesus. They devoted themselves to teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
Now, I need to pause here for a second because this prayer is not everybody's prayer. This prayer is not Jesus, give us today food and, and bread and protect my mommy. Mm -mm -mm. This was prayer that called on heaven because they needed strength to go on. This is prayer that called on the name of Jesus because they weren't going to make the next day without Jesus and the presence of God filling them with divine courage and appointment and hope. And I'm telling you, we've lost something as a church because we failed how to pray. And let me give you the context of this. The Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2. You can go read it later. He pours himself out on the people and the people then become witnesses empowered by God to go and reach their communities. And the reason and they came to the church to hear the teaching and the prayer was because they were so empty upon delivering the good news. They were so persecuted from teaching the gospel that when they came back, they were like, I need somebody to encourage me and I need prayer today. And you got to understand, church, this is why the Holy Spirit moved in such power, because the people of God were coming to the church wide eyed for the front row. I need teaching and prayer today, Pastor. And they knew when they showed up, Dolores, that the pastor wasn't trying to fill a seat, but he was trying to deliver the word of the Lord to stop and say, I'm going to pray for you, that the Holy Spirit would move. And it was in that prayer and in that teaching and in that unity that God began to recognize, my people are getting ready to carry my mission. My people are getting ready to carry my voice. I can bless this. And the Spirit comes and it pours itself out and unity is birthed in the church by the Spirit of God. Listen, unity will not come through gender. Unity will not come through political party or affiliation. Those are promises. They are lies. Unity will not come through anything except the Holy Spirit. Period. It won't come through race. Can I get a witness? We've heard all those cards played. We are all broken, sinners, flawed. But then the Holy Spirit empowers us where real unity can exist. And this is why the church, Danny, devoted themselves to teaching and prayer. And it's why they saw signs, miracles, and wonders. And I want to show you something that happened when they were obedient to the teaching and to the prayer. I think I've got it here. I'm jumping ahead to verse 247, but I want you to see what happened. They were praising God and enjoying the favor of the people, the unity of the people. That's what we're talking about. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I want to leave you with this thought. Doesn't it just make sense that we, the people of God, would look so different from the world because of our willingness to teach the Word of God, to pray for one another, and to allow the Holy Spirit to do divine work. So when the believer comes in, they leave going, there's something going on there. God's speaking to my heart, and this is the final thought I want to give you. Pray for me that we as a church don't fall into the trap. Pray for me that we as a church don't fall into the trap of thinking that our human strategies can grow God's church. They cannot do it. Pray that we would carry the spirit of the Lord in the coming and the going. That we would be humble enough to teach, to have fellowship, and to pray as the Holy Spirit would lead us. Would you stand with me all over the house? Friends, I'm nothing. I'm nothing but a servant of the Lord. But I need you to hear something as I shepherd you because some of you need to hear it. Don't follow the preachers who don't pray and call in the name of the Lord. Don't do it. Their idol is themselves and their pulpit. It's true. May we be a people humble enough to call on the name of the Lord. Father, build your church. I believe I've been obedient to the simple words you put in my heart. I recognize it's time to dismiss. And so in this closing moment, if there's anybody who say, Pastor, 
I know we've already given our life to the Lord, but something or everything you said today was from me. Would you slip your hand up? I want to bless you in the name of the Lord. I want to pray God's blessing in your life. We've already had a moment of salvation. Amen. Father, you've seen the hands of your people looking for a blessing from you. And Lord, as they have moved into a place of expectation, as they have forgiven their brothers, as they've walked in humility, and in that step of courage now, you see what we've done, Lord, in that step of courage now to lift hands. I'm praying in the name of Jesus that you would fill them with your spirit. And when they open your word tomorrow morning, this afternoon, that they wouldn't be able to shut off the flow of your voice, the conviction of sin, and the godliness that will come as a result. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Bless your people, Lord. Amen and amen. Go in the grace of God. We'll see you next week. Love you, church.